Good morning. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. This is such a beautiful country. Um, can I uh, walk around here a little bit? Um, so queen rearing to me is, is the most fun part of beekeeping. I, it's the most rewarding. I'm, obviously, you go through the stock selection and do that. I'm not going to talk about that. I'll talk about it later. But I want to talk about queen rearing and drone rearing because I think drones are they're not given a good enough rap most of the time, and they're really an essential part of that whole picture. And uh, for queen rearing, it's really about quality control, and that's all based on nutrition, which is really important. I mean, just looking at the difference between these cells, so if I sold you a batch of cells, which one would you want? It's pretty obvious there. I mean, what goes into that? I'm not gonna talk about different type of queen rearing systems, but I just want to give you the overall kind of concept. So when you have an egg, it, a, a, a haploid, or I'm sorry, a diploid fertilized egg, it can go either pathway. And that is all determined by nutrition. And th there's huge differences that what happens there between those pathways. And if you look at the worker bee, smaller size, all these different morphological differences, they're, they're, they have less ovaries, um, just all these different, they have the pollen baskets, wax glands, they're, they're designed for foraging and feeding brood, basically. The queen on the other end is huge. She's much longer lived, she's got all that ovary development. Um, so you have a totally different cast here, and it's formed, it can be formed from the same egg. So that's really something to look at. Um, if you look at the brood food, queens are fed royal jelly their whole life. It's highly nutritious. Um, initially, it has a higher sugar content that acts as a feeding stimulant um, versus the worker jelly, which is uh, mostly honey and, and bee bread combination, which is uh, less nutritious, and they feed much less of that. If you look at, where's my pointer here? Um, the number of feedings, that queen larva, her development is a day less, but she's fed about 1,600 feedings individual feedings versus um, the workers which are, which are fed about 140. That's a huge difference, and over the time also. So you have major differences between the feeding patterns, and the, the worker bees will recognize that. They'll recognize the age of the larvae, the cast of the larvae, and that food will change over time, so it's really critical for them. Um, what you're looking at here is this is just the growth rate of larva. After about three days, this is a worker larva, you see, it, they, they're almost kind of starving them. There's a, um, the less feeding here or the, with the growth rate, and then the queen just jumps crazy. She, her juvenile hormone, um, JH is juvenile hormone. They have about 10 times more juvenile hormone, and that develops all these queen characteristics who are really important for the queen. Uh, look at this figure. Whoops, let me go back there. Ooh, what did I do here? Sorry, guys. Um, 50 different morphological characteristics between the worker bee and the queen bee. So that's huge, very huge. Um, royal jelly, we know there's a specific protein called rolectin in royal jelly, and this contributes to that high metabolism, high growth rate, starts these queen characteristics. So that's really important for her. You won't find this in the worker jelly. We're learning more about these things uh, more recently. Um, also, bee bread contains um, uh, this, this acid, it's in honey and, and uh, bee bread, but you don't find it in real jelly. Picormic acid is kind of a, um, it, it slows the development of the ovaries, it makes the, the bees smaller. So the di you can see how different this diet is, how critical that is for the queens. Um, Laurel development, and again, your nurse bees, they're, you have an age group here that they have well-developed hyperferendal glands, they're doing the feeding. They also recognize the larva age, not just the cast, but the age, that diet changes over time. So initially it's very high sugar, which acts as a feeding stimulant, and then it kind of changes to more protein with a royal jelly over time. So that induces all these different queen characteristics, which you see. Um, a graft, so you want a graft, you, wanna, you want that newly hatched larvae to be recognized as a queen or a worker as soon as possible. If you can graft that within 18 hours, that's really good. So you, you want something that is about um, 
the size of a, about the size of, here's an egg, here's just a, a newly hatched larvae. You want to get that larvae as small as possible. So she's recognized and she's given that a specialized diet. That's really critical. So within the first 24 hours is really critical for them. Um, grafting, you, I mean, that's a very delicate process. You want to make sure you have high humidity, um, a nice, cool, strong light. I use a little, one of those OptiVisor headlights, magnifier things. Wearing glasses now, that kind of stuff. You can use wax or plastic. A lot of the commercial guys have gone to the plastic because there's a lot of concern about the pesticide residues and the wax. Um, I like grafting in, into wax, but that's kind of a personal preference too. If you're gonna graft into wax, make sure you um, dip your own cells. You can see the little larvae in there. I, uh, you can wet graft or dry graft. Dry graft is just, it's, it's much more efficient. If you, uh, you just pick up the larvae and put them in there. Most commercial guys do that because it's much faster and then you have somebody running and getting that larvae into the cell builder as soon as possible. Um, wet graft is a little bit of cheating, I guess. It, basically, what you're doing is just priming the cells with a little drop of jelly. So I'll, I'll mix that with, uh, I'll collect jelly any age, mix it with um, distilled water, throw it in the freezer, um, and give her just a little drop of that in the cells. It's not the proper jelly, but it, it's just a carrier. The bees will recognize that. They'll uh, consume it and give her, feed her the proper diet. But it just gives you a little more time uh, to get things and, and cushion her a little bit. Um, your cell builder conditions, this is really, this is really de determines the quality of the cells. Not just the acceptance, but the quality. You want good nutrition, you want a high population of young nurse bees that have the ability to, to, to do that feeding. So it's a lot of uh, environmental conditions there. Uh, the time of year of the season can make a big difference. Early spring, it's much easier to develop those. If, if you go with like the, the swarm season, it's much easier to Raise queens develop uh, a good cell builder versus later in the season when you don't have all the perfect conditions. Um, the, the bees that have well-developed hyperpharyngeal glands that have the ability to feed that brood food are about five to 12 days old. And this is kind of a, you, this is a, looking at the side head of a nurse bee. And if you look at these, um, the hyperpharyngeal glands are in the head here. This is kind of what they look like in a, a bee that's feeding um, well feeding larvae, feeding queen cells, whatever. So initially, it takes a few days for them to develop, and then they atrophy, they kind of shrink down after, and then when they go into foraging and, and uh, field work, things like that. So it's really critical that the bees that are doing your cell builder, doing your feeding, are, they look like this. So five to 12 days, you want those bees about one week old, which is really critical for them. Wax builders are a little bit older, but you want to look in your cell builders. You want, I want to pick up a bee and I want her, her wax glands to look like that. I want my cells to be nice and white. This is really a, a particular behavior, this festooning behavior is usually wax builders um, do that. So if you pick up a, the lid of a cell builder, you see those kind of festooning bees in there. And that's really what you want to make a good, strong cell builder. Um, oops, next slide. Yeah, so queen right, queen less. I don't really care what your system is, provided you can provide those qualities. Um, more, more food than they can possibly need, high quality food, pollen, um, sugar syrup, nectar, whatever it is, and also the high ratio of young nurse bees. You'll get, you can use, if you have a queen less system, you have this kind of emergency condition which is, um, stimulates acceptance much more, so sometimes you get better acceptance, but if your cell builder's set up right, you should get good acceptance. Queen right system is a little bit more uh, sustainable over time because you're, you have more brood emerging in there. If your queenless cell builder, once those bees age, you, you kind of lose the quality, unless you're, you can put some sealed brood in there, maybe get another graft out of it, but pretty much it's short term versus a queen right system. Um, you, you have that, you can put uh, more nurse bees in there too, but you have the brood emerging and the queen confined in some way, so she's continually providing those bees. And it's all about to, more bees and it'll fit in that box, really. You want to just really crowd it. That's one of the conditions of swarming, so really important for them. Uh, again, just lots of bees, just 
the easiest way to make a cell builder is just dump like nine pounds of bees in a box, put some pollen, maybe a little bit of sealed brood in there, feeder, good pollen patty. Um, have it look like that. Uh, the quality of cells, this is really going to make a difference in the quality of your cells. You, you want the bee, when you, I usually just leave a space in there, and as soon as you put the cells in, they, you can just see those bees um, going to that, the stimulus of having that larvae in there, something to feed. So it's, it's all about the quality. You see how well attended these are. Um, I like to mark my frames in there. I can put uh, the name of the mother on there, the date she's grafted, and you want to make sure you, you pull those cells before they emerge. That can be a big problem, 10 days. <laughs> You've seen that problem, I guess. Uh, nook production, again, the size of the nook is gonna vary a lot with the operation, commercial production, whatever you're doing. Um, all different sizes, you got two ways, four ways. These are the little, um, this is Northern California, the little peewee nooks some of us use. Um, and these are, these are, this is kind of an assembly line. You put in a cup of bees, a frame, queen cell, syrup, and then they go into a cool room um, here's the syrup in there. Go in, go, well, let me back up a little bit. What, what's going on here is putting in frames and syrup, and this goes through the wall, and they're coming out here, and then slapping in comb and a queen cell. Here's some bulk cages. They're scooping bees out of these bulk cages, putting them in there. And then they go into the cool room. For, if that unit is not very cohesive, if you just put it out in the field, they would abscond. But if once that virgin emerges in there, um, it's more of a cohesive unit and they'll stay with her. If you can put brood in the mating nooks, that really helps to stabilize them much more. And also, you, I think you have uh, better warmth in there, um, better feeding. Again, even, even during that, the time between the virgin emerge and when she's laying, you want to have good nutrition in there. And the larger the colony, the better fit it's going to be, the better able those nurse bees will be able to feed her. So all those things you need to kind of consider in the in that. Um, again, these boys are super important. They're really half the story. Um, here's a mating sign. So it, those queens will, de depending on the, the, the mating is, it, they'll mate as early as four days. I've seen that, but it, mostly it's about six, 10 days out. And if you have really bad weather, it can be two, two weeks out. Just depends on the, the weather conditions number of drones in the area, how many flights they take, um, a lot of different things. So your mating yards, these are some California yards. Um, these are uh, two ways, beautiful. You look at that bloom in there, really beautiful. The peewees, these are um, some more small ones. Um, what you want is, you see this windbreak here? You, you want to put them in an area where you have kind of a protected area for that mating flight. Wind is really difficult for the bees to mate in. Um, usually it's kind of a, a valley between mountains or something like that or whatever you can do. But you can see here, this is a really um, beautiful area for mating, wind protection here. Um, okay, the queen, this, this is amazing, the, um, how she mates. You have this multiple mating. We, we call this extreme polyandry. Poly meaning many, andry meaning drones, many drones. So. These queens are mating with a huge number of drones, and it's kind of an amazing, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it, they mate like bam, 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 really fast. And that mating sign, it has some um, ultraviolet properties, so if she has a mating sign, she's actually more attractive to the next drone. It's kind of opposite with most animals, where you're looking at more competition type stuff. But, but the bees will recognize how well mated that queen is. She'll have a bigger pheromone bouquet, um, if, she's, if she's not well mated, they'll, they'll tend to give her less attention, feed her less. She won't have that, that nice court around her. Um, and oftentimes they'll try to supersede her. So that's her language. Her pheromone is her language. It says, it tells the age, her quality, her condition, how well mated she is, how old she is. Um, all these things are really important for the bees that way. So. Drones, these guys. Um, I think this is the hardest job in the whole process of getting in queen production. We don't pay a lot, of, we haven't in the past paid a lot of attention to drones. With the introduction of Varroa, which you're all dealing with, um, this has become much more difficult, I think. Um, all the reproductives are gonna be a little bit more sensitive to pesticide residues, um, any kind of 
uh, pathogens, diseases, whatever, it seems like the drones are the more vulnerable. They have a longer development time, bigger cell. I think that's really attractive for, for all mites. Uh, I use these. Do you, you guys have drone comb here? You must have. Yeah, of course. OK, I use these green frames. Um, and I, I push that drone production early, early spring. Uh, I, I put it just, just outside the brood nest, and as, as they expand in the spring, she jumps on that. Generally, they like little patches of drones. I don't like this full frame, but I have a little bit more control over that. Uh, late in the season, that last frame of, of drone usually goes in the freezer because it's full of mites by that time. I have chickens. The chickens love it. They know what that green frame is. Um, I got neighbors that come by and empty the freezer for me. <laughs> pretty good. But really, they're, if, if you look at queen production, kind of think of drones in the same realm. They have, um, they have a particular diet. Their diet is very similar to, it, it's really a high protein. We haven't really researched that or explored that very much, but the amount of energy that goes into that drone production is huge. If you don't have good protein in the colony, um, and that really depends on your pollen. Different types of pollen have different amino acids, different quality of, of proteins. So it's really important you have that mix of pollen in the hive uh, for the drones as well. And if, if the bees perceive something not quite right, the drones are the first to get kicked out. It can Seasonally, um, that's a big thing. In the spring, they're making lots of drones. It looks easy. But if you try to push drones a little late in the season, it's way more difficult. We recently introduced um, Caucasica, Caucasian bees to the US, re reintroduced them from um, Republic of Georgia. And they're, I work mostly with carnies. They're even more strict than carnies. They would, within four or five days of the first poor weather in the fall, you, I just have drones, a bunch of drones that have been kicked out on, on, the, on the ground, which is kind of devastating sometimes because I wasn't quite done with them. But, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, uh, it's a bit of a lesson. Don't do your queens too late in the season. Uh, everything gets more difficult, but they will definitely regulate their drone population. And uh, you've seen this behavior where they're kicking them out. If you, again, if chemical residues, pest path pathogens, take a lot of care. And as, as Dave said, that care really starts in, in late season, winter time, G given those bees time to recover from whatever production you've been doing, build up, get them on good feed, good natural feed. We don't have a substitute for pollen. We have some protein supplements, but nothing will take the place of pollen. It's a really complex food, so it's important to get those bees on some good forage. Um, drone congregating areas, you, they, they, th these are amazing. These are very stable areas where the, where the drones will fly out. You've got these flyways where they fly into this and then they kind of circle in these congregating areas. And it's usually kind of a clearing along a tree line, a valley between uh, some mountains or somewhere where they're kind of protected from the wind. Um, and you, you get drones coming from hundreds of colonies, two, three hundred colonies, and these can be like 30, 30, 20, 30,000 drones in this area. And it's a very random mating process. So there's some thought that maybe they mate uh, in the flyways. I think drones will go from one congregating area and fly to another one. The more experienced ones may have a little route they take. Um, and again, the odds are not, you know, the odds of how many of those mate is pretty low, but really important that they have that kind of uh, congregating area. Here's a, a mating sign. Has anybody ever seen that? When this queen comes back, she's quite, she's running around, she's very excited, she's very well attended. The bees are trying to help her remove her um, mating sign. And that's really important for them. That, that we know that that uh, attention, that motion, is r running around and being attended is really important for sperm migration. And, and with instrumental insemination, that's the conditions we'd like to try to provide for her. I'll talk about that later. But uh, so it, if, if you're trying to do isolated mating, figure there's roughly, at peak season, there's roughly 2,000 drones in a colony, but maybe half of those are immature. So figure maybe 1,000 drones per colony. And, and to create that congregating area, you really want numbers. You want at least, I don't know, 10, 20,000 drones up there to create that so you get some good matings. And if you, if you can put those um, a kilometer 
one to three kilometers away from your mating yard in every direction, you'll get pretty good isolation. We know they fly at least, they fly up to 11 kilometers, which is, I mean, that's a really extreme stretch. But if you isolate yourself within like seven kilometers, you can get pretty good isolated mating uh, doing that. Uh, 25, am I getting down there? My time. Uh, mating flights. The queen will take one to five. I think most of them take maybe one or two. And, and she has a perception of how full her oviducts are. She, there's stretch receptors in there. So she'll, um, it takes about 48 hours for the sperm to migrate, but she'll have a sense of how full she is. Um, and that'll depend on the, the drone congregating areas, how many drones are in the area, the weather conditions. If you get a really nice day, maybe she can do all that mating in one day. It just depends. We know that they'll mate with up to 60 drones. Is that insane? 60? That they've counted that many? Um, the average is probably uh, 15 to 20, but pretty amazing that they can manage that. And the whole thing about bees, it, I'll talk about the breeding stuff, it is, is the diversity, the outcrossing. The more different drones you mate with, the better fitness you have. The more ability to deal with um, pests and diseases, weather changes, climate change, all those things. So, um, lots of little steps in this process, and you want to try to optimize all those as best you can. I mean, it, it's, it's the selection, it's the rearing conditions, it's providing good mating conditions, um, all these things along the way. And again, nutrition is huge. Um, you really have to have those young nurse bees, and they have to be well fed. And if you can get them on natural pollen, that, that is so much, that is so important. You can put supplements in there and you can feed them sugar syrup, but a natural flow um, is, is really hard to duplicate. So that's really important for them. Um, queen rearing is qualitative and quantitative. What I mean by that, it, it's, it's just, it, it's a combination of many things. It, it's the genetic background, it's the environment she's raised in, which leads to good development, it's, it's how well she made it, what drones are in the area. All these different factors come together um, and if you're raising queens, again, if you do it during the swarm season, things are way easier than trying to push it late season. I, I, I'm, I'm here during my peak season, you guys. My August is going to be really difficult when I go back. The flow is over. I got the, the yellow jackets come in. And it's not nice. So, and my, my Caucasian drones... I might have until the second, third week of August before they kick them out. So, you know, just... If you can plan things during the swarm season, every, life is just much easier.